Good afternoon. Welcome. Uh, I'm Dan Garrison from Fresh Start Funding. And I'm Matt Hartley with Fresh Start Funding as well. Welcome to our uh, webinar today on how to double or even triple your practice by using zero down and bifurcation in your Chapter 7 practice. Um, a little bit of housekeeping before we get into the substance today. We're using Zoom for our webinar today, and many of you are probably familiar with it. For those of you who are not, we are going to take questions at the end of the presentation, but you can type in those questions at any point in time that they pop into your head. So if we're going through an area and you want a little clarification or a question comes to mind, go to the toolbar at the bottom, click on Q&A, and you can queue up your question for us. We won't be using the live chat feature, so you can go ahead and ignore that. Um, so uh, before we jump into the substance, it might help a little bit to know a little bit about who we are. So. Yeah, of course. So I guess I'll, it's always hard to talk about yourself, so I'll talk about Dan. Uh, so Dan's uh, my partner here at Fresh Start Funding. We started the company together. And uh, Dan's background is he was a bankruptcy lawyer for more than 25 years. His focus was primarily in the commercial part of uh, bankruptcies, but he also did do some consumer work. Uh, he's been uh, ranked as a national uh, lawyer, one of the best lawyers in the country, and a Southwest super lawyer. Uh, he's also uh, spoken and written on a variety of bankruptcy topics on a national level and really is a true asset to the bankruptcy community with uh, the work he's done. Sure, thanks. So my partner and friend Matt Hartley here is also an attorney with uh, over 25 years of experience, uh, graduated from top 10 law school and actually started his career uh, in sort of the large law firm space, practicing in real estate. Uh, realized after making partner that he preferred the entrepreneurial route, and so he actually went into private lending for a number of years uh, very successfully before several years ago deciding that he wanted to get into the consumer bankruptcy space. Yeah. Uh, and so Matt started a law firm here in Arizona where we're located that he quickly grew to being the largest chapter seven filer in the state of Arizona and, and one of the biggest actually in the country. He was filing upwards of 100 cases a month uh, at the peak of it. Sometimes more than 100. Yeah. Those are little crazy months I've tried to block out now. <laughs> And we'll talk a little bit about Matt's story building his practice and the challenges that he experienced and how Zero Down really became kind of a key thing for him because Matt's origin story is really kind of the story of, of how Fresh Start funding came into uh, being. But before we jump into that, maybe we can talk a little bit about why we're doing what we're doing and, and uh, why we started Fresh Start funding. Yeah. Ba basically, Matt and I recognized a gap in the marketplace. Yeah, it was the classic. The clients come in, you you talk about you know, their, their situation, you realize they need to file bankruptcy, and you end the conversation with, great, you, know, you definitely need to file bankruptcy, I can help you, I know you're broke, now give me $1,500. I mean, it was always a, an awkward conversation, and of course some people can pay it, but so many of them can't, and it was a problem. Yeah, and you know, there've been, uh, there's been a lot of attention given to this lately. Uh, you know, the Notre Dame Law Review just published uh, the results of the Consumer Bankruptcy Project study that intermittently kind of looks at the uh, effectiveness of the bankruptcy system. And, and they actually concluded that debtors are languishing large, longer than ever uh, in financial yeah. distress without filing bankruptcy. And at least one of the reasons why they are is that they can't access the system with an attorney. Um, the stats are really kind of stark. If, if a debtor has the benefit of counsel in a Chapter 7, they have virtually a 100% chance of getting a discharge. Uh, if they go in and file a case pro se, those numbers drop by almost 30%. And as I think all of us know who sat through reaffirmation calendars and whatnot, pro se debtors are a huge burden on the system. They require a lot of time and resources from the judges and their staff uh, to help them through the process that they don't really understand. And all of that time and effort goes into uh, often a failing you know, process for about 30% of those, those folks. So, yeah, and even ignoring the discharge, they get some really bad results sometimes. They may get a discharge, but they still may have an asset that they lose that otherwise could have been protected with some planning or have to deal with the unfortunate preferential payment to their mother. Uh, I mean, it's just there's just things that having an attorney, as you all know, helps these people out a lot. Yeah, so the interesting thing is even though we work with attorneys and law firms and they are essentially our customers, our corporate mission is making a fresh start affordable and accessible to everyone. And we really focus on the debtors, the end users of the system, as the ones who benefit from the services that we offer and the way that we partner with attorneys to help them build their practices. Yep. So, you know, we mentioned that Matt's origin story is kind of the company's origin story. And Matt started his firm kind of on the heels of the Great Recession, you know, when there was a filing boom. 
And I know for a long time, it was an all-you-can-eat buffet, yeah. you know, in consumer bankruptcy, but that didn't That's last right. forever. No, it didn't. I mean, the, the number of filings just declined every year. And for, for quite a while, we really weren't affected by it because we were just doing so many cases and we were, we were good at what we did in terms of marketing and the like that you know, we just kept getting lots of, lots of clients. But it caught up to our practice as well. And it started getting to the point where prices were dropping. I was worried about, you know, making money with the firm. And uh, it got really challenging. And then um, I tell a story, you know, one night I was at home and I was stressed out about what I was going to do with the law firm. And um, so I thought I'd do some checking to see what some of my competitors are doing. Because I always tracked, you know, what other attorneys were doing, how much they're charging. I wanted to just make sure I knew what was going on in the marketplace. And I was really surprised when one of my competitors who had never filed more cases than me, all of a sudden did file more cases than me. And so my initial reaction was, oh my gosh, someone dropped the price again. This is going to kill me. Um, so I went online, I, I pulled up his uh, attorney fee disclosure, and I was shocked that he was actually charging quite a bit more than me. And the other interesting thing was that, you know, in Form 2030, you put in there your total fee, how much you collected before you filed, and how much your client still owes you. And it showed that his client still owed him money. And, you know, because a typical Chapter 7 under the traditional model, that's always zero. Your client doesn't owe you any money once you file the case. So that got me very curious about what was going on. And that led me down the trail of finding out about bifurcation and the 20 years of case law that, that support the practice. And I ultimately got, got comfortable with it and you know learned the pitfalls some attorneys that had and that there was a right way and a wrong way to do it. And uh, so I started doing it. And as soon as I started advertising zero down, it was like pouring gasoline on the fire. My, my marketing became more effective. My phone was ringing off the hook. More clients coming in, retaining more clients. I mean, it was really great. And, you know, that's sort of, I guess, the, from, the, from my standpoint, it was great for me. But at the same time, it was great for all these people who otherwise couldn't have had an attorney represent them in a Chapter 7. Yeah, and, you know, that's really the key to our business and our philosophy about this. We, we call it the win-win-win. Uh, basically, you have an opportunity to grow your practice, get out of the price war that you're probably in right now, and do much better uh, by helping more people, by helping folks who couldn't otherwise afford to hire an attorney and who otherwise would either have to keep languishing in financial distress or file pro se and face the prospect of not actually getting their discharge or, or experiencing some of these yeah. other problems that Matt had described. And it's also a great benefit to the system because it, it does get these folks in gets them on their way to a fresh start, makes them productive without being a burden on the bankruptcy system. Yeah. So let's talk about how zero down is going to help more people and help you. I mean, some of this is going to be obvious, but some of it's not. Um, so, you know, the, the main thing with zero down is you're absolutely going to get more clients and you're going to be filing more cases. But the first place you're going to see this in, though, is at the initial consultation. So nationally, uh, what we find, and we talked to lots of attorneys, uh, nationally, it's about 50% of the potential clients that come in the door actually retain attorneys. And I know some attorneys do better than that, and some do worse than that, but the average really is about 50%. So if you have 10 potential clients come in, uh, you'll get you know, five clients out of that typically. But as soon as you offer zero down, it, it changes that dramatically. So uh, whether you realize it or not, when people are coming in and they don't retain you, um, many times the reason they don't is that they don't have uh, the money to pay you. And so they may say, hey, I can't afford this, or maybe you put them on a layaway plan, but a lot of them will just say, mm, I, I'll think about this and I'll get back to you. But what they're really, what's really going on is they don't have the money to pay you. But as soon as you have a zero down option for them at that initial consultation, if you are filing, if you are signing 50% of the people, you're going to, you're going to, uh, actually sign up 70 to 80 percent of them. So it really makes a big difference in the number of uh, clients you get out of just your existing uh, pool of, of potential clients. The other really powerful thing that we see is that this has a huge impact on your marketing. So for those of you who are already using pay-per-click advertisements, Google AdWords, that sort of thing to advertise uh, your practice, um, we see the results from those ads once you start messaging around zero down double or even triple. Uh, we work with a number of national marketing consultants who work regularly with consumer bankruptcy attorneys who tell us that there really is only one way to differentiate yourself anymore in the bankruptcy space, and that is by offering zero down terms. And I, I know I was speaking to one of them just the other day, and he told me that on average, his clients are seeing an 11x ROI on their advertising dollars. But we tell folks all the time, you absolutely can expect the effectiveness of your pay-per-click ads to go up by one and a half to 2% very 
to that 2%. <laughs> One and a half to two times very easily. Yep. Um, which just, it, it, you know, if you're paying a certain amount of money a month to generate those 20 consultations, you're going to see that amount double. And then you're also going to experience the increase in the retention rates that Matt was talking about. And it's not hard to do the math to figure out what that does to your practice. Yeah. So let's talk about one of the things that a lot of people don't realize is going to happen. And I certainly didn't expect when I started offering zero down in my practice. And that is that your referrals are going to go up. Uh, it, it, to me, it was almost like the craziest thing. I thought when I first started doing zero down, I started getting all these additional referrals. And I always got referrals, but my referrals went way up. And what I figured out and what attorneys that work with us now have figured out is that when you offer a zero down option, you're giving people something that they don't expect. They don't realize that they can get the relief of bankruptcy, uh, stop their creditors, stop garnishments without having to come up with $1,500 or $2,000 to make it happen. And when that happens, they really appreciate, appreciate you as their attorney and they're excited and they tell people about it. So tell their coworkers, their family members, their friends about it and the word spreads. And I always laughed. It was funny. We would, we would file a case for someone at a, at a company and all of a sudden we start getting all these people in the same company coming in, you know, one after another uh, and all talking about, you know, getting filed right away and wanting to make payments over time. I mean, it was just great. So your referrals will go up. And, and the number we're actually seeing uh, now is about 30% increase in referrals. So, you know, we tell folks all the time that you absolutely can expect to double your practice by offering zero down if you're not currently offering it. But anecdotally, we see results much higher than that. I was talking to one of our clients in Texas the other day who joined us early this year. And in the first three months of their uh, adventure in zero down, they saw their practice increase by six X. Uh, they went from filing five cases a month to filing 30 cases a month in the course of about 90 days. Yeah. Uh, it's just, it's almost, it's almost more powerful than you can conceive right now if you're not currently offering zero down. Yeah. Another important thing we get asked about a lot is are the fees. Because uh, in Chapter 7s and flat fee Chapter 7s, attorneys are really discounting their billing rates. Um, you know, we see where attorneys are often uh, typically charging maybe $250 an hour for work in other bankruptcy matters or even other non-bankruptcy matters. When they do a Chapter 7, there's so much price competition that when they look back at the, out, the time they put in, their staff time that goes into it, and then calculate what the hourly rates are, they're, they're shockingly low. Yeah. They're nowhere near what they charge in other matters. Yeah, we, we go through this exercise with attorneys all the time, and we actually have a tool that we've developed. It's a spreadsheet tool where you can put in your hourly rate, your paralegal's hourly rate. It has sort of a list of the typical services that you might do in a, in a flat fee chapter seven. Uh, you can adjust that to fit your practice, but what it spits out at the end of it is if you were charging your normal hourly rate, whether it's for domestic work or it's for non-flat fee bankruptcy work, what should your fee really be in a chapter seven? And it's an eye-opening exercise. The flip side of it is we talk to attorneys who uh, are charging $795, $895 for a chapter seven case, and they figure out what their effective hourly rate is, and it's often well below $100 an hour, where they're charging $250 an hour for non-bankruptcy work. Yeah. Um, and this is really a tool that can liberate you from that price competition that's driven by how competitive it is to find clients right now when you don't have something that can differentiate you from your competition. And, and really, it's as simple as explaining an option to a client. Yeah. So part of the reason why retention rates go up so much is that if you're out there saying it's $1,500 to file a Chapter 7 and you've got to come up with the cash first, if you can offer them an option where they can pay $25 or $30 a week instead over the 12 months after their bankruptcy is filed and they can get the relief right away, they will always choose relief sooner and cho choose the payment plan. Yeah. And attorneys are able to get back to a reasonable hourly rate equivalent for their fees by changing, uh, changing the, the playing field essentially by offering options. Yeah, and so I want to be real clear though, we're, we're not by any means suggesting that you're gonna gouge clients or that you're gonna charge unreasonable fees. I'm just talking about having a reasonable fee. You know, in section 329, you know, you still have to follow that. You have to, be able to justify your fee, but we find time after time that people are very much undercharging and they can absolutely increase what they charge and still be completely fine under section 329. Yeah, and we'll talk about this in a few minutes when I kind of go over some of the case law behind uh, bifurcation, but there was a very recent decision that kind of went through this entire analysis and 
approved the idea that you can charge more in a zero down chapter seven where you're offering post-petition payment terms as long as you can justify the value you know that's tied to your fee yeah so let's talk about an example of a client where this could really help them um you know i was talking to an attorney yesterday about this and he just signed up with us and just talked about how much better the consultation went by having a zero down option so it's kind of a classic client they came in uh, it was a single parent. Their wages were being garnished. They could barely buy gas to get to work, let alone, let alone buy groceries. And he described it as in a normal situation. The person would come in. They'd talk about the situation. Uh, he would have to say, okay, great. I can help you. I can stop that garnishment. I can make everything go away. All you have to do is pay me $1,500 plus a 335 uh, filing fee, and I'll make it all happen. And you get the dirty look from your client, like, I just told you I'm broke. You know, how am I going to pay you all this money? But now, he said, in this, con in this consultation you just did, he gave the client two options. He said, here's my normal fee. It's $1,500 if you pay up front plus the filing fee. Or I have another option. It does cost more because it costs me more as the attorney. And it allows you to make payments for 12 months. It's $2,000. So if you want the other option, I can follow you as soon as you can get me your paperwork. I can stop that garnishment. I can put you in some small payments. It's going to be you know, less than $40 a week uh, to make those payments and uh, get you taken care of right away. And the client just immediately smiled and like, my God, this is so great. Thank you so much. Uh, this is wonderful. Let's move forward. Yeah. And, and from an attorney standpoint, it was just great because we all want to help people. Yep. And, and that really is the key to this, is providing a, a client an option uh, that may fit their situation better, yeah. clearly explaining the difference between the two approaches, and letting them make the choice. Yep. Yep. So um, we need to kind of walk you through the mechanics of offering zero down terms to your clients and, and really explain what bifurcation is all about. So I'll kind of give you just a general overview, and then we're going to turn it over to the expert here, Matt, to kind of walk you through the nuts and bolts of, of an actual conversation with a client and setting up your engagement. So the fundamental nature of offering zero down terms to clients is bifurcating your chapter seven agreement. And bifurcation very simply means splitting something into two parts. The two parts that we split a chapter seven engagement into are your pre-petition engagement agreement and your post-petition engagement agreement. You do a skeleton rush emergency filing pursuant to a pre-petition engagement agreement. You have the client come back in after the petition's filed they sign a post-petition engagement agreement for the remainder of the normal Chapter 7 services, and you handle the rest of the case in the ordinary manner. Now, it's as simple as that, and Matt will walk you through sort of the nuts and bolts that kind of put flesh in the boats. Yeah, this is still super simple, but let's just walk through what it looks like really in terms of your interactions with a potential client. So the client comes in for the initial consultation. You determine, of course, that they need to file bankruptcy, that they don't have the ability to pay up front, or have some other reason why they just need to get filed right away. You explain to them, you know, the two options. Uh, they choose that second option to make payments post-petition. You have them sign that uh, the pre-petition fee agreement that Dan just described. You give them the list of documents they need to bring back and tell them to take the, uh, the credit counseling course. They then bring back the documents to your office. You prepare the skeleton, rush or emergency filing, all the same thing. It's just called different things in different parts of the country. Um, uh, you prepare that, they come back to your office, they of course review it and sign it, uh, and then you file that to get the case started. Uh, and you, just, you also file the credit counseling, social security statement, there's a couple of documents you have to file. Uh, it's real clear in the code what needs to be filed and we have a list of that to help you out. Now at this point you've not prepared the statements and schedules yet because you're doing that after the case is filed to create additional work to justify the post-petition fee. So case is filed, client comes back, uh, you would, well, the way I did is I prepared the statements and schedules before they would come back then. They'd come back, they'd sign the statement, review and sign the statements and schedules. They'd sign that second uh, fee agreement, the post-petition fee agreement, and they sign what we call our payment authorization, which is just a document that authorizes Fresh Start funding to collect the payments on your behalf and communicate with the client about their payments uh, and discloses our relationship uh, with you and, and make sure the client knows everything. Uh, they sign that document. And then you, you file the statements and schedules, attend the 341, and do anything else that comes up in the case, and just complete it in a normal manner. So it's really that easy. So it changes things in the front end a little bit. and does create a little more work. Um, but it's, it's really, really simple. And once you do a few of them, it'll, it'll be super easy for your staff. Yeah, two things I would say about it. One is that we will absolutely walk you through this process. Mm -hmm. We'll talk about our onboarding process and our training, but we're very serious about making this as simple for you as possible. Yep. And the reason this works 
is that you, you have a separate post-petition engagement agreement that's not subject to the automatic stay and it's not subject to discharge in the bankruptcy any more than if they went out and bought a car on a used car lot you know, that offered payment terms the day after they filed the Chapter 7 position. That car loan wouldn't be dischargeable, collection of it wouldn't be subject to the automatic stay, and this yep. is actually no different than that. Yeah. Well, speaking of that, let's talk about the, the legality and the ethics around this. Yeah. So, uh, you know, this is a new concept for some folks, and I'm imagining some of you who are listening to the webinar today, it's a new concept to you too. But truthfully, it's actually backed up by about 20 years worth of case law that's painted a very clear roadmap about how you can legitimately collect post-petition payments from clients in a Chapter 7 case. Yep. Um, and, and, and it recognizes the, uh, the, the fundamental proposition that if you have a post-petition obligation, it's just not part of the bankruptcy. Um, the case law, you know, involves basically three different buckets of cases. There are some cases out there, including this real recent one that we'll talk about in a second, that just clearly approves everything that the attorneys are doing. Uh, there's another category of cases where, you know, attorneys have gotten into trouble because they have committed one of just a handful of uh, very simple mistakes in the course of, of bifurcating a Chapter 7 case. Or there's the bucket of cases where, you know, folks just didn't even bother to try and bifurcate. They've just tried to collect payments uh, under a traditional engagement agreement after the bankruptcy is filed. And even in those cases, the courts often explain, you can't do it that way, but if you would follow this yeah. roadmap, it's legitimate. Um, this most recent case that came out, the Hazlitt decision, which is out of Utah, um, really is kind of a culmination that very clearly lays out the roadmap. And, and it candidly parallels an article that we wrote last year for the ABI Journal that explains that case law history and, and kind of paints the picture of how this can be done legitimately. And on that score, I will tell you, we have a number of assets that might be interesting to all of you. We have two articles now that have been published in the ABI Journal. Uh, the first just kind of talking about the basics of bifurcation. And the second one, which just came out about a week ago, talks about disclosure. Um, talks about using Form B-2030 uh, to adequately disclose these things to the court, and then also talks about fee-sharing issues, uh, which comes up in the context of this. Um, so we've got that. We've got a case law summary. Um, we're both kind of nerdy, I will, I'll be honest with you. We'd love to talk to you about some, yeah. of, the, <laughs> so, some of the nuts and bolts of this stuff. Um, but, but again, the, the fundamental premise here is that there is a solid line of cases behind this that really, once you read them, removes any doubt that there's a legitimate way to do this. The Hazlitt decision was a 27-page decision that was issued by the Utah Bankruptcy Court back in April that really kind of broke all of this down and talked about rules of ethics, talked about the bankruptcy code and the bankruptcy rules and how a properly executed bifurcation absolutely can be done uh, consistent with the bankruptcy code and with the ethics rules. Um, actually talked about the fee setting issue too and, and laid out a roadmap for how you can uh, charge more for a, a zero down case than you do for a traditional engagement without running afoul of uh, you know, Section 329's reasonability requirement. Yeah. So, um, well, I guess we're talking about the legality, we should talk about how we, we back up our, our clients that work with us. Yeah. So, so, so we're so confident, confident in this that we've actually uh, offered this some time ago. We, we have a, what we call our Fresh Start Funding uh, Defense Guarantee and Indemnity Program. And what that means is that uh, any attorney that works with us follows our best, our best practices and uses the forms, which of course you can modify, but use our forms uh, in terms of all the disclosures that need to be made, that if you are challenged by a U.S. trustee or a judge questions it, we'll defend you. Uh, we, we will come in, we'll draft briefs, we'll, we'll handle hearings, we'll do anything that, that would be required. Uh, and if it came to, to having to be appealed, we would appeal it. Um, but, but we know we're right, and the case law is right. So if you do it the right way, it's not going to be a problem, but we are there to defend it. And we also have an indemnity component of it as well. So if, despite all our efforts and despite all the case law out there, the judge would order a disgorgement of fees, we'll indemnify you against that loss. So we really have you covered uh, with, with our defense guarantee and indemnity. I will tell you, um, sort of as a spinoff of that too, we're actually out there looking for attorneys that are interested in uh, trying to get a decision in place in their district uh, that uh, approves these practices. And so um, we are uh, interested in talking to someone who's motivated to file an adversary proceeding, which we will handle the same way we would the defense of uh, you know, motion against you, 
so that we can get a declaratory judgment in your district that clarifies that, the, that this is all legitimate. Um, our sense is that uh, with the 20 year history that we have in the case law and some recent decisions that have come out, if we start seeing you know, three or four more of these pop up around the country, there will cease to be any discussion about whether or not uh, this is legal or ethical. It'll just become the accepted way of practicing in chapter seven. And, and candidly, it's already happening. Um, the fact is, whether you know it or not in your market, there is probably someone and maybe multiple someones who are offering zero down terms to clients and just doing it very quietly. Uh, but it is becoming the accepted way of offering chapter seven terms to clients, at least as an option to the traditional structure. Yeah, but well, we know for a fact that there's literally hundreds of attorneys doing this and there's tens of thousands of cases that have been filed. So this really is the, uh, the way the practice is going. Yeah, we may have mentioned this early on, but we're actually working with a couple hundred firms in 40, going, going on 45 states now, not quite 50, it'll be 50 pretty soon here. Um, and so th this is something that is, is very quickly taking over the Chapter 7 bankruptcy market. Yeah. So let's talk a little bit about the services we, we provide. Um, one of the most important services we provide is, is the financing. So you know, attorneys sometimes ask, well, couldn't I do this on my own? Or like, of course you can. But just keep in mind that if you start doing work and not collecting your fees for 12 months, it is going to create a cash flow problem for you. Uh, and then when you go to collect all these payments from your clients, it, that becomes a big burden on your staff. Uh, example we use often is if you file 10 cases a month and you put them on weekly payments, by the end of the year, you'd have 120 cases you're collecting payments on. And uh, so you'd really be managing about 500 payments each month from that pool of clients. And it, it can be a lot of work. And what we bring to the table though is we have lots of technology, we have trained staff, and so, you know, if you compare our, our success to attorneys doing on their own, we're much more efficient at collecting. Our, our collection rates are below 10, our default rates are below 10%, and most attorneys who do it on their own are more like 20 or 30%. So it's a real value proposition in having us uh, handle the, um, the, the collection of it. And then in terms of the financing, so there has been some discussions out there and some other cases unrelated to us about factoring, and we do not factor. Uh, and we do believe that firms that factor the receivables are violating the ethical rules. I believe it's section uh, rule 5.4 uh, dealing with fee sharing um, and, the, and, the, and the opinions out there are very clear on this. That, that is a violation of the ethical rules and attorneys have gotten in trouble with that. So the way our financing is structured is it's structured as an actual line of credit, much like a bank would do. Um, it's, um, there is, we don't charge you interest and the payments are made by your clients. There's no minimum monthly payments by you. So it's, it's a, we consider a very safe line of credit to our clients, but it, it's structured so that it's not fee sharing and you're not going to have any issues uh, with our financing. Yeah, as many of you may know, Form B 2030 actually asks you to disclose whether or not you're fee sharing. And so the article that we just published in the ABI journal, among all of the rest of the recommendations that we make about how to disclose things to the court talks about the fee sharing issue. And so for those of you that want to take a little deeper dive on that subject, that article that came out uh, in the July issue of the ABI journal kind of walks through the differences between a recourse line of credit like our program and factoring, which is, you know, considered a, a fee sharing problem for attorneys. Yeah. Now let's talk about debtors that qualify for our program. So, um, you know, debtors do have to meet some minimum requirements uh, in order for them to qualify for the financing, but they're pretty, it's pretty simple. So a debtor has to make at least $2,000 a month in gross income. Uh, they have to have either a, um, a bank account or be paid on a prepaid debit card. And the reason for that is we have to make sure we have a place where we can uh, pull the payments from. Um, and then the, the, payment that they make each month can't exceed 10% of whatever their gross monthly income is. So again, if they make $2,000 a month, the payment can't exceed $200 a month. And we finance between $1,000 and $3,000 per case. Um, so some attorneys are on the bottom end and some are on the top end. Um, and we, we also do make some exceptions because geographically things do vary. Um, incomes are lower or incomes are higher. And so we can make adjustments for different areas, but those are our general guidelines. Uh, we also have uh, an option for people who don't meet the $2,000 requirement. They can have a third party payer qualify for them. So they can use a parent, a child, a friend, uh, really anybody. Uh, the only difference is that person would have to make $3,000 a month gross instead of $2,000 a month gross. So at the end of the day, most people can figure out a way to make it, make it work. We actually just rolled out recently what we we're calling our silver program too. So recognizing that there are a lot of 
uh, older Americans who need access to bankruptcy but are on fixed incomes, whether it's social security or pensions, that just can't meet the $2,000 a month income requirement. We've waived that requirement for people over the age of 62. Uh, in those instances, those folks still can't have their payment exceed 10% of their monthly income. Uh, but you know, for someone that's making twelve or thirteen hundred dollars a month in Social Security, they can still qualify as long as their payment's not above one hundred and twenty or one hundred and thirty dollars a month. Using those examples, which means for those of you who want to offer perhaps a discounted Chapter Seven fee to uh, older Americans uh, to allow them access to the bankruptcy process, we can still provide you financing and payment management services for those folks too. Let's talk a little bit about how you get funded when you're in our program. So once you file a case, you upload just a few documents into our system. Uh, it's primarily the, uh, the post-petition fee agreement, the payment authorization, the notice of the bankruptcy filing, and then just their proof of income. So you upload those documents into our system. Uh, we underwrite it typically the same day, and then we approve it. And then we fund people on Tuesdays and Fridays. So every Tuesday and every Friday, attorneys receive uh, wire, wire transmission of funds through ACH into their account. Uh, and so the whole goal is to get money out to attorneys within three to five days of them filing the case. And, and really the timing depends a lot just on how quickly the attorney uploaded the documents to us, but we turn them very fast. So, you know, I think it bears talking about the fact that, you know, this um, is a model that's driven by incremental business. So obviously there's a cost of participating in the program and attorneys, you know, uh, often ask us, well, you know, why should I, pay you a fee to provide these services? Well, first and foremost, it's about growing your business. Um, the folks who have embraced the idea that zero down and offering that option to clients is the way to drive people into their office and offering that option is going to get more people uh, to sign engagement agreements are seeing just huge increases in their practice. When you co combine that with the idea that you, you can, if you're interested in it, increase your fees by offering this different option to clients, we very commonly see folks who are able to adopt our program and have it be cost neutral to them as compared to offering a traditional engagement. And in fact, a, a number of attorneys that work with us are able to actually increase their profit margins by doing this, both as a function of increasing the amount of their business and by increasing their fees reasonably. Yep. Um, so I guess at that point, let's talk about how you get started with us. Um, as Dan mentioned earlier, we have a, a great onboarding process. It, it's critical to us and anybody working with us that things are done correctly. Uh, and so once you sign up, well, to get going with us, you basically call us first and we'll explain more details of the program and send out an agreement to you. And you can reach us, uh, either go to our website, which is freshstartfunding.com, or you can call us at 1-800-915-6545. I'll say it again. 800-915-6545. Um, and we'll, we'll get you started right away. We'll send an agreement out to you. Uh, once the agreement is signed, uh, we set up what we call our Lunch and Learn series. And so for every, every office that's working with us, we again, want to make sure everything is done correctly. So we have all the forms, which is great, but we also have all the training and knowledge you need to do it right. So we have videos, there's actually nine training videos. They total about 45 minutes. So what we do is we have you huddle everybody in the office that should know about this, which is almost everybody in a typical office. Uh, we buy you guys lunch, and then you watch the 45 minutes of videos. Then you get us on the phone, and then either Dan or I and uh, Rich Mac uh, will get on the phone and we'll answer any questions that you guys have. And then just talk about your practice, you know, where you want to go with your practice and what it's going to take to get there. Because we really have a lot of good information and resources and third parties too that we can refer you to to really help you uh, get your practice wherever you want it to go. Yeah, you know, we often talk about our company is not being so much a financing company or a payment management company. It really is a business transformation company. This integrated package of services that we offer, the financing, the payment management, actually I don't know that we even talked about this, but we also credit report uh, for debtors. Um, you know, this is actually a huge benefit and a huge selling point to debtors too. You know, the, a lot of them are not thrilled about having to file bankruptcy. They understand that their financial distress has hurt their credit score before they even file. And then they also know that the bankruptcy is going to hurt their credit score too. Uh, by credit reporting, we're the first step actually in these folks starting to rehabilitate their credit. And that becomes a powerful tool in our payment management process too, which by the way, is very friendly, constructive, outward facing to your clients as you would want it to be. The message is always, we're part of you getting you know, back on your feet financially and rebuilding your credit. 
how can we help you stay on track? And if that involves modifying payment plans to fit a new pay structure they have, or it means taking a hundred dollar payment that they missed and can't make up and splitting it up over the next five or 10 payments. You know, we work very constructively and creatively with folks, but that credit reporting piece is very important. And then you combine with that, you know, the financing, the payment management, our defense guarantee and our indemnity policy and all of the best practices training, support, and forms that we have. And, and really, we're talking about tools to transform your practice, not just finance uh, cases. Yeah. So let's talk about you know, the, how you get the most benefit out of this program. So we have attorneys that sign up with us, and they view it maybe just as we're a tool that they have. So if it comes up in a consultation that somebody can't pay, if they remember, they'll mention it to the client and try to, try to sign up the client you know, with the zero down option. Totally fine, you can absolutely do that, but you're gonna miss out on a lot of the benefits of, of what Zero Down will really do for your practice and your clients. What we recommend and where we see the most success is where uh, attorneys start adopting the Zero Down across everything they do. So first is in the marketing. So all their marketing is about Zero Down, it makes it much more effective, makes more people call, and makes more people show up for that initial consultation. Have the zero down as an option at every consultation. Give your client two options. And we have another tool we can give you. It's a piece of paper that your client can see visually, which will show, well, if I pay up front, it's this. If I make payments, it's this. This is what my monthly payment or weekly payment or bi-weekly payment is going to be. Gives them an option so they can really decide what they want to do. So you roll that out at every consultation and let them be the decision maker on what's best for them. Uh, and then because that will get more referrals to you. And then through that whole process, by, by adopting zero down through everything, that's where you're going to double or triple your practice. So we're excited at the opportunity to help you grow your practice and, and to really be part of that win-win-win that allows folks access to the bankruptcy system who couldn't otherwise afford to hire an attorney. Um, we're very serious about wanting to make the Fresh Start affordable and accessible to everyone. And our entire organization is driven by the passion for trying to help attorneys grow their practice by helping more people. Yeah. So again, go to freshstartfunding.com, call us at 800-915-6545. Um, we will have our, our folks talk to you. Matt and I can be reached directly and answer questions. I guess with that too, we gotta to see whether we have any uh, questions that are queued up. Um, well, actually even before we do that, let's talk about one other thing we have for you. So when you, when you first get started with us or I mean, sometimes attorneys do this just to test the waters to see if they want to sign up with us. But we have a, a template of email that we can provide you that you can use. And, and what you'll use this is look at back at the clients that came to your office. Well, not really clients yet, but the people that came to your office that didn't retain you. Um, we're going to give you an email that you can send out to all of them. It comes from you. And it says, hey, you're in my office. I know bankruptcy is what we both thought was in your best interest. I want to let you know I have a new program where I can get you filed right away. You can make easy payments for 12 months. And this email is incredibly effective. Uh, attorneys that use it uh, find that about half of those clients come back to their office and, and move forward with them. So it's a huge tool. So just reach out to us after this and we'll get that to you. Yeah, and that if you, if you have any question at all about whether this might work for you, that email will be proof positive for yep. you. Okay, so let's take a look at the questions that are queued up for us and see if we can uh, answer some of those. Okay, so uh, Barbara is asking, how do you recommend addressing the filing fee for the court? Matt, you want to feel that one? Yeah, so you have a couple options there. Um, so some attorneys will uh, try to have their clients pay the filing fee up front. Uh, it does always raise the question of, well, was it really zero down? Can you advertise zero down and still have your client pay the filing fee? I say the answer is yes, as long as you're disclosing on your website that that is an additional fee they have to pay and the zero down just refers to the attorney's fees and not the, the costs in it. Um, but what most attorneys ultimately do when they really uh, adopt the zero down model is they finance the filing fee as well. So uh, we'll, fi we'll, we'll finance you know, attorney's fees and costs that you want to put through so you can put it all into zero down. A lot of attorneys also just do it on a case-by-case -case basis. Person comes in, if they can pay 335, great. They collect it in a normal manner. If they can't, they increase the, the total cost that so they're gonna pay and they, they put it in the fee. So two options. Yeah, and uh, Jill asked a similar question. How does this program impact filing fee waivers for low-income clients? And, and, and the simple practical answer is it's very difficult to get a filing fee waiver in most districts if the person's in a position where they can be making installment payments on their attorney's fees. Most judges will look at that and see a fundamental disconnect 
between those two things. So typically we don't see attorneys obtaining, obtaining filing fee waivers uh, for clients to participate in the program. Similarly, we kind of discourage against attorneys filing uh, requests to pay the filing fee in installments because as all of you know, uh, you can't collect attorney's fees while a client is still paying their filing fee to the court. And so we can't be in a position where we're out there as your agent collecting an installment payment on your fees when your client's still making installment payments to the court on the filing fee. So yep. uh, really the way that Matt illustrated to do, to do it is the practical best answer there. Um, I think that handles a couple of the other questions. Let's see what else we've got here. Um, Barbara also asked, why is $2,000 the floor for qualifying? That is very low in Hawaii. And, and you're right, it actually is quite low in Hawaii. Um, it is a minimum. And I, I will tell you that attorneys who really think about this program also give some thought to, you know, which clients are good candidates for this. And if you've got a client, I just talked to an attorney this morning, as a matter of fact, who said, if I have a client that's consistently not paying their rent payment, not paying their car payment, maybe I don't want to put them in this program. And there's nothing wrong with you all looking at your clients and doing a little bit of underwriting qualification on your own. But we need to have, you know, a, a threshold that fits sort of an average across the country. And we just determined that $2,000 is the minimum. The other thing to keep in mind, though, is that in a jurisdiction where the cost of living is a bit higher, the fees are probably going to get higher. And so the 10% um, threshold is going to operate as a second kind of protection against putting people into an installment program where they just don't have the ability to pay. Mm -hmm. Questions there? As you see, I have to put my glasses on to see these. Uh, so yeah, we've got someone asking for the site for the journal articles. They're both in the ABI journal. I don't have the exact um, volume and page sites. Well, actually, the easiest place to get it is on our website. Yeah, actually, you're so right. If you go on our website, um, you can get it. Although the, the second article that literally was just published this month is not on our website yet. So you can just email us for that. You can fill in the uh, request info or call us and we can send that to you. But the first one that really covers sort of the big picture of bifurcation, that is available as a download on our website. Uh, so Jason asks, do you typically run a means test analysis before signing the client up? And I guess this is a broader question that we ought to talk about um, that I, you know, I think we alluded to in the description, but maybe didn't hit hard enough. And that is, despite the fact that you're going to push the work of doing the schedules and statements to the post-petition environment, you absolutely do want to do your diligence on the client to make sure that they qualify, to make sure that it's in their best interest and to make sure that there aren't pitfalls out there that you're not discovering until after the case is filed. And the way to do this really is to have a robust intake questionnaire. Yeah, and, and, and the means test in particular is one where oftentimes you know if a, if a client's gonna qualify and sometimes you know they're not gonna qualify and, and then there's the ones that are in the middle that you're not sure. If you're not sure, go ahead and do the means test because the last thing you wanna do is file a case and then find out later they don't even qualify for chapter seven. So as Dan said, you have to do your due diligence. If you're not sure about the means test, go ahead and do that before you file a case. And I will tell you though, without getting too much into the weeds about this, we do occasionally see cases that dismiss or they convert to chapter 13 for various reasons after they've filed. And we always work with the attorneys to come up with a solution that doesn't involve any sort of cash refunds or anything in our financing. There's almost always a practical solution that we can find for those scenarios. But obviously doing your diligence and making sure that someone qualifies up front is the best guarantee against that. Yeah. So, yeah. Well, I think that pretty much answers the questions that are yeah. up there. Yes, yeah, so um, we'll repeat. So, yeah, I think we answered all the questions. All right. Well, thank you for joining us today for this webinar. Um, again, we're very excited at the opportunity to talk to you about how we can partner with you to help you grow your practice by offering zero down to your clients. And again, we're very committed to making a fresh start affordable and accessible to everyone. And hope to talk to you all soon about how that can also benefit your practices. Yeah, thank you.